December 1944, Hitler wages one last desperate attack. It's really hard to believe, but it, it happened. We had been surprised and were in trouble. The bloodiest battle in American history. They were like hugging each other and just shivering from, from scared. Never had seen such a thing before. Because after you're in combat a while, dying is a lot easier than living. Battle of the Bulge, tonight on American Experience. Nature is not a friend, it is an adversary. And yet you must admire the beauty of it. And also you must admire the, the danger. It is so efficient as a danger. Both the enemy and the weather could kill you. And the two of them together were a pretty deadly combination. The snow was very, very heavy. The cold was down around zero. The fog was dense, so you really couldn't see much beyond grenade range. At night, it was so quiet. Anything that made noise, you could hear it. The stillness. And the, the snow sort of insulated everything. And then, too, the trees were thick and you couldn't see very far. If you, you were lucky if you could see sometimes 20 or 30 feet. There's nothing out there in the woods and in the trees that have any compassion towards me. It seems like that you in this deadly struggle under miserable conditions and the whole universe is united against you. In August of 1944, as American GIs swept into Paris, a gruesome winter campaign seemed unimaginable. Gene Derrickson of the 28th Division wrote home to his wife. The roads we journey now, and we are traveling fast on foot, are littered with Nazi equipment burned and destroyed. Along the road, I've eaten blackberries, carrots, apples, and pears, then a good night's sleep soft sleeping on flax. Four months before the Battle of the Bulge, Derrickson and his division led the parade through Paris, past the reviewing stand where the brass stood. And where the brass stood was clear. Hitler was now on the run. Ike had a standing bet the war would be done by Christmas. To be present when this triumphal march took place was as though it was a reward for victories won and uh, the enemy defeated. People were hugging and kissing and giving people things. It was a kind of a delirium. The troops came down the Chantus Elais and uh, progressed to the uh, Place of Concord and we, we alternated playing marches with the French band. There was just wall-to-wall -wall people everywhere. And they were oh, cheering was... and grabbing the soldiers and hugging them. Boy, that was beautiful. 
After five hard years of war, the Allies had won back Casablanca and Tripoli, Naples and Rome, Cherbourg and St. Lo. The list of victories seemed to grow each day. It looked to us as though we had um, certainly turned a corner. We were now so triumphant, and this, our, sh our show of strength and of moral uh, position and moral strength was so uh, astonishing, was so um, uh, inspiring. It was very hard to be objective about it. One afternoon, I was sitting having a glass of wine and watching our traffic stream by. Just a steady procession of tanks, trucks, tank carriers, unbroken for hours, loaded with troops and everything under the uh, end of the sun. It was a feeling that, by golly, any nation that can produce all of these things, ship them all the way across the Atlantic, all the way across France, and chase the German. This was a country that could do anything. We had a grand ride right across France. We were not held up anywhere, and we went all the way uh, on to the uh, Siegfried Line. The German was running very, very hard. Once the Gestapo was ushered out of Paris, Allied staff officers and war correspondents reclaimed the bar at the Ritz. Restaurants reopened, fashion shows came back. Women could hope for silk stockings again. The War Department was shifting troops over to the Pacific. For the first time in years, U.S. production of tanks, ships, and ammunition was allowed to dip. From late October through November and early December, they were building up for this attack. Their production level reached its highest in the fall and winter of 1944. So how'd they do that? I'm talking about tanks, artillery, trucks, ammunition. They were cranking it out in these underground factories that had somehow evaded our Air Force. The German counterattack was conceived and planned by one man, the Reichsfuhrer Adolf Hitler. Hitler was, by his own lights, a man of destiny. For him, Germany's suffering was merely a test of its will. He'd seen four million Germans killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. No matter, he would create a new army with a fancy name, the People's Infantry, the Volksgrenadier. What it was, was an army of cripples and convicts, children and grandfathers. But the Fuhrer was in a state of euphoria. His Volksgrenadier would join the very best troops he had, the Waffen-SS, in a surprise attack in the West. Everything must be set aside for this, Hitler confided. It will lead to collapse and panic among Americans. Hitler? knew that something was wrong. Back in October, September, October, he knew that he was leaking. Orders that he gave were reaching the Allies. He thought he had spies in his staff, but he did the one thing that made it impossible to do anything with it, and that is shut up. Radio silence in effect. And when it stopped coming, it just happened to stop coming in a period when